This PowerPoint covers some of the commonly asked questions about rebuilding these transmissions, these 4060E transmissions. And they, it also points out a lot of the things that students end up doing wrong, probably because the service information confused them or misled them. There are special tools to remove this oil pump, but most shops probably A, don't have them, and B, wouldn't use them even if they did, because there's an easier way to remove this oil pump. Once you've pulled all the bolts out, you can stick a pry bar in this opening right here. You can actually see the pump through that opening, and you can pry up on it. Now usually, it's, it's a, since you're only prying on one side of the pump, it'll get cocked in there. But if you take a saw face hammer and tap the input shaft while you're prying up on it, kind of tap it towards you, it pops it loose, makes it come out really easy. And about the only thing that you can do that's uh, get carried away is if you're prying hard on it, you can put a little lip on the transmission case right there. So if you run a flat file over that after you're done, just to make sure there's no high spots. But other than that, that's how most people will pull the pumps out on these transmissions. Torrington bearings, if you haven't had much experience with those, a lot of people put those in upside down. Some of the Torrington bearings are idiot proof where they have a very high lip on it and the bearing just won't sit properly and it should point out, you know, if you're trying to put it on wrong, it should just stand out as like, well, this doesn't seem right. But um, in this case right here, this Torrington bearing is on backwards or upside down, however you want to look at it. Basically, if I were to look at a side view of a Torrington bearing, I'm going to have an a inner race, like if it was a cutaway, that'd be the inner race. I call that the inner race because it wraps up around the inside there. Erase that and start over. So the inner race wraps up around the inside. And then I have my little needles in there that will work as the bearings. And then I have an outer race, which wraps up around the outside of the bearing. So it might be hard to tell on this image here, but I can see part of the outer race. And I can see that the inner race is kind of curling around towards the inside there. Well, if the bearing is designed to fit around the sha uh, shaft, it will fit closely to the uh, shaft. The inner race will fit closely to the shaft. If a bearing is designed to fit in a pocket, You'll find that the outer race is designed to fit closely with that, kind of wrap up around the pocket. Put your needle in there. And um, then the inner race will basically be able to do its thing and won't have to contact anything. Because what happens is when you install these things upside down, that you're going to start making metal. Because this race right here is going to spin and it's going to come into contact with that shaft right there. And it's going to end up causing a gouge and create some metal, so that's going to be bad. So anyway, get a Torrington bearing in your hand. Realize that the inner race is the part that wraps up around the inside. The outer race is the part that wraps up around the outside. And if it's designed to fit in a pocket, it'll be machined close to that bearing. And when you lay it in there, it'll look like it's supposed to be there. It's, it'll just sit in there perfectly with the outer race touching it, landing in that pocket. If it's the bearings designed to fit around a shaft, the inner race will fit closely or around the input shaft or whatever shaft, and it'll drop right in. When you get to the point where you're trying to rebuild the low reverse clutch or do the measurements for it, a lot of students get these confused. When you have this taken apart and you see your clutch stack up in there, um, you're going to, you normally would have a wave five steels and five frictions and they want you to look at these steels to see if there's any of them that are kind of a either thinner or thicker and if you have one that's thinner or thicker than all the others you're going to want to put that one to the side if they're all the same size you just take any old steel plate out and throw it off to the side so when you're done what you're going to do is you're going to create a stack with one wave plate five frictions and four steels and you're going to put your low roller support assembly this big cast iron chunk of cast iron you're going to lay that stack that on top of the stack and measure down from that surface to a nice flat surface i mean we've got some nice flat tables out there but ideally you do it like on a granite block or something like that and then you average your readings where it confuses the students 
is that I've got five steals and five frictions in a wave, and it tells you to pick four. So how do you know which one you leave out? Well, you just leave any old steal out when you do this measurement. You first check to see if you have a thinner one or a thicker one. If you do, put that off to the side because that's selective. That's a, that's the actual adjusted steel. But if they're all the same, you basically take any old one off, put it to the side. Then when you do your measurement and you look in your specs in the book, it's going to say you need either a zero, a one, or a none. And the zero is a marking that they'd have on the plate. A one is a marking that they'd have on the plate. And that's either a thicker or a thinner than a normal one, or they have a none, which means it doesn't have any markings on the plate. So most of these low reverse clutch packs will require a normal plate, which would be a none. That's where it gets confusing too. They should say no marking, because when they say none, people want to leave a plate out. But in reality, the none just means there's no marking on that plate, and uh, therefore it's just a normal plate, so you just take a normal plate and you put it in there. So anyway, it's this is also described on the overhaul video, and it is also described in the service manual too, but there are a lot of times students get confused by this whole process. When you're building this thing up and putting the snap ring in, we have what's called a case saver that lives in there. And that case saver keeps this whole low housing tensioned in the counterclockwise direction. Remember, that's the, the direction that it's going to hold the reaction carrier and input internal gear. It's going to keep it from spinning counterclockwise. So the idea of this case saver, it works like a little spring that pushes this whole housing in the counterclockwise direction. And by doing that, they put the lugs on the support assembly. The lugs are in contact all the time with the aluminum case. There's no clearance or gap. Because if there was, like say if you forgot to put this in and there was a gap there, every time it downshifted to first, it would click to take a little bit of that slap, uh, slop up and it would slap the lugs in the transmission case. Well, you'll end up eventually beating the lugs out of the case by doing that. Uh, so if you actually preload this thing in the counterclockwise direction, so that way the low support lugs are always in contact with the case lugs, there's no slapping that's occurring and it's not gonna prematurely wear out the uh, case lugs. If you look, and we'll see these on some future slides too, is that the snap ring opening needs to be located around that case saver. So that case saver kind of has a weird shape to it, fits in there, almost looks like a mangled snap ring, but it's there to work as a spring. Here we see this uh, in this direct in this area of this transmission case, you can see the lugs are broken out of the case because whoever installed it previously did not have the snap ring that fits in there and holds this whole low support assembly in there. They didn't have it in the right direction. If you look, the lugs were, act or the snap ring was going over the case saver. And if you go over the case saver, it's barely contact, the snap ring's barely contacting some of these um, lugs. And the force from the low reverse piston broke the aluminum, so it's not good. So go through and make sure that when you install this, that the snap ring openings are around that case saver. As I mentioned, there's that case saver. And then you can see the snap ring is not over the top of that case saver. On the valve body towards the bottom of the transmission, we're going to see a special, there's actually two check balls that have uh, little capsules that hold them in there. One's for the third accumulator, and we'll see that in a little bit. And then there's this also this low reverse check ball. And the way it works is that when pressure is going in, it's going to seat that check ball, and it's going to force all the fluid through these orifices that are on the side of that check ball. And then when, and that's for reverse actually. So when you take it out of reverse, and they want that clutch to release as fast as possible, and the fluid when it exhausts back out, it will unseat the check ball and allow the fluid to get out quicker. So it orifices the fluid as it goes in and then allows for a quick release. Um, if you, what you'll find in a lot of these transmissions when you take the valve body off is that check ball may be either missing or the, um, the, the whole capsule assembly is completely worn out. So you have to replace it. And those aren't that expensive, so it's probably a good idea just to replace them anyway. 
but the capsule, uh, if you don't see a check ball in there, you know it went into the case somewhere. It might be behind that low reverse piston. When you air check the low reverse piston, you can blow air into this hole, and that checks the small surface area of the low reverse piston. But you also need to make sure you air check this passageway. And since it has that, that, that orifice type check ball, you really can't just stick a nozzle in there and get it done. So we, we've got plates that have holes and little rubber pads, but in the old days we used to use a hockey puck with a hole drilled in it, and that helped. You know, hockey pucks are relatively flat and they're rubber, so you can push that down onto a part and um, create a temporary seal there. That sun shell is a known weak spot, and the older style reaction drums basically had like a real sharp angle right here. And what ended up happening is all that stress would eventually create a crack. And when it cracked, it would break this section off of the hub. That's the part that splines to the sun gear. So when that breaks off, you are, you're not able to hold or drive that reaction sun gear. So what ends up happening is you lose second, fourth, and reverse. The uh, GM did update it, so there's a better AC Delco one, and they put a nice fat radius on there, and that helped prevent the cracks. A lot of shops, they'll definitely get rid of this drum because they don't want to come back because of this. And then they'll either update it with the uh, updated Delco drum, or they'll put an aftermarket drum. This one's from what they call the Beast, and you can see it's even thicker yet. And then there are other companies like Sonics that makes what they call a smart shell, and they they, it's like a two-piece shell. It's uh, even better. So it all depends on the amount of torque or horsepower your vehicles, the engine is going to produce to find out if you want to do upgrades to these transmissions as you go along. There's another component in here that a lot of technicians neglect to check, and it's this third accumulator exhaust check ball. And it works with the servo assembly that when the transmission shifts into third, fluid is going to release the same fluid that applies the three four clutch is going to release the band that's applied on second and the way they do that is the fluid is going to come in from the valve body it's going to seat a check ball right up in here and the fluid is going to enter into the servo assembly through this what they call the third accumulator exhaust check ball or just third accumulator check ball and then when it's um, released when there's no pressure in there like if you downshift in the second, gravity is going to let the check ball fall and fluid that's in there can quickly leak out into the transmission case, which we'll see here in a second. So if you had a, a problem where this wasn't sealing properly up here, if that check ball didn't provide a good seal when it's seated, that you could lose pressure to that 3-4 clutch assembly. So they have a process in the service manual to have you check that for leaks. They have you fill that assembly up uh, with the servo in it and the transmission case is upside down valve body side up you fill those cavities up so that way you've got basically solvent in there and on one side you have an air bleed that's all in the servo assembly uh, in the opening as well in the case so you should see solvent dripping out of that but next to it where you got this big kind of coarse cutout on the case you should not see any solvent dripping out of that uh, you could also use the Sonics vacuum pump and put a piece of rubber over that and draw, see if it sucks that ball in, if it draws a strong vacuum. Uh, but a lot of the, the service manual has you fill it with basically um, solvent and see if it's dripping out. A lot, of, a lot of times people put a little bit of ATF in with the solvent so it colors it and makes it a little easier to see. When you're building the input drum, there's a, a seal that fits pretty closely that's a little difficult to see. It's in there. Uh, it's a green O-ring. So if you've taken it out, it's a good idea to right away put one back in. I, I have a habit that when I'm changing seals, I only change the seals when I'm ready to put the new one on. So that way I can match them up and I don't get them mixed up, the old and the new. Another thing is when you're putting this input drum together, is there's a there's a couple uh, seal installers. This one here will help you drop the forward clutch housing in there. And if you don't put the seal installer in when you push that in, there's a pretty sharp lip that, that we find on these input drums. And it could catch that inner seal and tear it. And if it does that, 
then you know you're going to have possible problems with these clutches applying because they'll have a leak trying to get everything in is a little tricky so the best way in the service manual actually does uh, spell this out but most people don't read it all is you lay these apply the three four apply fingers down with its little um, return spring the forward piston in the forward housing and you drop that all together so that way it's sitting um, all together and then you're, we're going to take that and we're going to put it in the input drum holding it and, and with the seal installer in place and we're going to push it out of our hold and to get it to slide all the way in this is what happens when you get carried away with the foot press this is the input uh, the forward piston return spring so when the forward piston is released it pushes the piston back in you have to obviously take this spring out so that way you can take the input drum apart so people go over to the foot press and they push down on this like like it needs to go real far or it takes a lot of force and they end up the bending and distorting it and that's not good because uh, even if we try to straighten it out we have to put like a pipe in there try to straighten it out and tap on it and when you do that you actually end up shrinking this hole and then you get to the point where this thing doesn't even want to fit in the input drum and then we have to replace it so and it's all because of um, being sloppy so please don't push down on these only push down on these spring retainers enough to get the snap ring out and in this case there's a ledge and you can only move that thing about an eighth of an inch before the inside edge of this uh, spring retainer catches that ledge and then the more you push down all you're going to do is bend it so be careful with that same thing with the low reverse piston return spring at the bottom of the case it's easily distorted when we air check this input drum the very top set of holes is the overrun and when we check it we actually have to put our finger over the hole that lives in this middle section and the reason why is because it'll it'll the way the lip seal is designed it'll actually leak into the forward clutch passageway and as long as I put my thumb over that hole uh, I should be able to fill the overrun up and it should be a nice tight solid seal with no leaks at all and when I check the forward by itself I shouldn't have any leaks I wouldn't have to cover any holes the so the middle set of holes I should be able to put air pressure in and it should just hold perfectly I shouldn't hear any leaks and then the 3-4 when I uh, do an air check on the 3-4 there is a, a bleed orifice that's located kind of where the bearing sits down in there and you do have to put your thumb over that hole when you check it it's a small orifice but if you don't do it if you don't put your thumb over it you'll hear it hissing out of that one of the things I, I have to remind students too is that do not ever uh, do an air check unless you have all the clutches in there the reason why is because there's a lot of force that gets generated if you think of the surface area that we've got behind these pistons like that 3-4 piston that lives on the bottom um, you know it's probably I'm gonna say it's um, at least four inches in diameter and it's it's actually got a pretty small let, let's use the forward piston for example the forward piston is about six inches in diameter and the hole in the middle is about we'll say two inches so I don't think it's that wide but we'll just say that for the simple sake of math and we know surface area is pi times radius squared so the outside radius would be three square it would be nine times pi which I'll just make it simple times three so now we've got 27 square inches the inside if it was two inches in diameter the radius would be one one times one is one one times three is three so we would subtract that because it's not applying across those two inches in the middle so we've got about 24 square inches of surface area on that forward piston if I apply it even with 40 psi or let's just say 30 psi we're talking about 720 pounds of force so just with a 30, um, 30 psi of air pressure across 24 square inches we're creating 720 pounds of force in that forward piston 
and it's designed to compress a clutch pack. If I don't have that clutch pack in there, that piston's gonna come up and it's gonna put all that force on that return spring. It's gonna possibly pop itself out of the four, the four clutch hub, or housing, I mean, the four clutch housing. If it does, when it loses all that air pressure, the return spring's gonna try to push it back and it might cut the seals. But, or it's gonna bind those springs and it's gonna put all that force in the snap ring groove and on the snap ring and on those parts. Those aren't designed to hold that piston in. What keeps the piston from coming out is the clutch pack that it's compressing. So needless to say, make sure you have a clutch, the clutch assemblies in there before you air check anything, or else you might damage the drum, you might break something, it might be dangerous, it might shoot something out. So be aware. With the 3-4 clutch, they also include these things called boost springs. And the purpose of a boost spring is to keep that top plate and the bottom plate separated, kind of pushed apart from each other when the clutch is not applied. Uh, they attributed some of the 3-4 failures to the clutches glazing over and getting hot because when the, the clutch isn't applied, like in reverse, first and second, and these things have to kind of freewheel and move, that they were kind of dragging on, I guess. And... Um, causing the, the frictions to fail. One of the things you need to make sure is that uh, a lot of technicians leave them out, but since they, a lot of them believe in them, but um, the, the springs, the part that, the, well, the spring that sticks away from the metal clips that kind of retain the springs, make sure they're facing up. Also make sure that you've got the, 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 this metal support assembly is well below the surface of that top friction because you want to make sure that when this clutch is applied it's not squeezing and basically resting on these boost springs and not and ending up applying the clutch that's not very common but it has happened out there where the clutch pack clearance was on the high side and when the piston actually came up and applied it bottomed these springs out on these little metal clips and actually didn't it still air checked okay but it didn't apply the the clutch because these kind of hung them up. So, but usually you'd have to have clutch clearance over a hundred thousands for that. And most people run the clutch clearances a lot tighter than that on these. Since the three, four clutch is a weak spot, a lot of aftermarket modifications and even the OE has changed their design. So they've got some uh, coated plates that handle heat better. Uh, they've got more friction discs in there from the earlier units, but there are companies like Alto that makes um, different uh, clutch package, uh, three, four clutch packages, depending on your application. Raybestos has uh, what they call a Z-Pack that has, and that's what this is that we're showing a picture of. It's single-sided frictions, so you can actually get 15 friction surfaces opposed to the stock 12, or depending on what year or vintage you have, you might have 14 um, there's seven friction disc, uh, like the 4L65. And then there's also Raybestos offers just a different friction disc, like the GPZ clutches, and they are they handle heat better. They seem to have a, be a better uh, wear characteristic. So there are different, definitely aftermarket upgrades, and uh, depending on how the vehicle is being used, if it's going back stock or if it's going into something performance, it's worth looking into these performance upgrades. When you're putting this back together, this is the area that probably a third of the students end up getting wrong. Either they have the Torrington bearing flipped upside down so that I don't see the black side up, but I see the flat, the silver side, the, the outer race is facing up, or they do what's shown in this picture where they put the Torrington bearing down, then they put the selective washer. The selective washer goes in first. There's actually a little spot that's machined just to accept it. And then the Torrington bearing sits on the selective washer and it lives um, above it. And where the reason why I think a lot of people get the Torrington bearing wrong is because they think it's designed, the, the bearing's designed to fit around a shaft because you have an input shaft there. But it's actually, there's a lot, and you can't see it in this picture because the picture's not that great, but there's like an eighth of an inch gap between the shaft and the inner race of the bearing. So it's actually designed to fit very well and very snug with the pocket on this input drum. So the outer race is designed to kind of fit in and wrap up around this pocket. And the inner race 
where it wraps down, you still have like an eighth of an inch bet between that and the shaft. So it's not fit, it's not fitted tightly to the input shaft. It's fitted tightly to the pocket that they machine in the drum. But also it goes selective washer first, then Torrington bearing second. There are uh, a couple upgrades that you can also do on the um, the 2.4 band. A lot of shops will just go ahead and put the 4L60E stock band back in. They're, they are actually good. They're durable. Uh, there's no real reason to upgrade it unless uh, um, some people just do it because they're gonna they had a damage some damage going on so they're gonna just put a different one in anyway. But you can actually get what they call wide band and it adds about another quarter inch of width. This is an example. This is the OE one right here, and the wide one. You can see it's just a little bit wider. It utilizes a little bit more of this reverse drum. But one of the things that you can see this reverse drum saw some heat. So you want to not only check it to see if there's hard spots in it from overheating for slipping, but there's also a straightness check. You want to make sure that you lay a straight edge across of it, across it, and see if there's any daylight showing, showing that this is a dished drum or something like that. And also look at the flaring that could occur. You want to make sure that this the um, the the lugs on this imp uh, this reverse clutch housing. You want to make sure the lugs are not flared out. That shows where this thing this possibly believe it or not the sprag could have been slipping, causing this drum to over rotate, and centrifugal force will cause these things to kind of flare out. And that the same thing could be on the the shell that this engages to. So it's worth looking at there. When you put the reverse piston in, it's got a pretty big lip seal and it won't drop into the drum. You can use a feeler gauge and you could also use transparencies. So these are just simple like overhead transparencies and that helps glide the piston in. They actually started making, when they first came out with this transmission for many years, they didn't have a seal installer. They just expected it to use a feeler gauge or a loop of wire or something. But now they actually do have a seal installer available. But in class, we just use these uh, feeler gauges. Or there's also a green disc that we have in school that will kind of allow you to spin it and work it around. But the big key is, is that you don't want to cut the seals going in or roll, flip them over by pushing them in and forcing the piston in. So, um, yeah, try, try one of these transparency methods to see how that works. When removing the servo, there's a o-ring there's a clip that goes around here a metal clip and you have to pop that metal clip out and then you put, take a pair of uh, channel locks and you grab onto the end and you pull it out what ends up happening is the o-ring that seals this cover falls into that that snap ring groove and then you fight getting it out if you take a pick and carefully stick the pick under the o-ring and kind of lift it up and i'm not showing it here because i had a camera in my hand but if on one hand you're lifting it up like this and on the other hand you're working this back and forth with the channel locks it stretches the o-ring out when you stretch it it becomes thinner and then boom your servo cover comes right out and the nice thing about that is you, you we can reuse that o-ring we didn't do any damage the servo assembly is got a lot going on with it and like this is the servo cover this is what we see from the outside of the transmission this is the fourth piston I don't know why they make it this way but if you look this part of the piston this nub sticks out further on that side than it does on that side so you can get that assembled wrong if you're not paying attention and this is actually the correct way to install it down here this uh, this piston right here is our second servo piston so fluid pressure will actually come in here when we shift in the second. And this piston will come in and apply the servo, the 2-4 band, and apply the servo. And then when you shift in the third, pressure comes in on this side and releases. It actually it doesn't release relieve the second pressure. It just overcomes it because there's more surface area on this side. That releases it. And then when we shift in the fourth, they don't get rid of second or third pressure, but they bring in fourth and they apply the fourth piston and that allows it to move independently. So it's kind of a pretty, it's a cool uh, design that they have, whoever came up with that. 
and but there are also ways that you can assemble it wrong if you accidentally flip that fourth piston what will end up happening is when you put the cover on you assemble the transmission it's going to move this servo pin in about an eighth of an inch and when it does that it's going to apply your band and it might just barely apply it so then you end up dragging the band on you will overheat the band and you'll probably cause problems so pay attention when you take it apart but make sure it goes back together like this because that's the correct way there's a special tool to measure pin length and they want you to put this take strip the pin away from the servo so you just got the pin and you put it in there then you put the special tool on there then you take your torque wrench and you tighten it up to or you kind of tension it to a hundred inch pounds of torque and you look through this window right there for that scribe line I could see it in there and that means it's the right length but here's the problem only thing you have in here is the pin the servo pin that when you go to assemble this thing and if you misassemble it you would really have no way of knowing so on the next slide I show you a way that I do it that actually has you check a completed assembled servo and if you got something wrong it would point it out So this is the realistic method was what I would call it is basically you're just using a pry bar and the pry bar you're using the um, you're prying off of like the transmission holding fixture or anything and you're moving the servo cover in and out in and out and as you move the servo cover in and out you're measuring how far the servo cover is moving and it should not move more than an eighth of an inch but you should at least get a sixteenth of an inch of movement if you did this before the valve body's on and before the pan's on you can actually just while spinning the input shaft you can make sure the reverse drum still can spin when it's released and then obviously you'll see it tighten up when you apply it but you want the reverse drum to be able to move while you're spinning the input shaft if it doesn't it's probably too tight uh, but when if it is spinning you want to make sure that it's not too loose you want to make sure the cover doesn't move more than an eighth of an inch On uh, this image is uh, I, I can share this with a personal history if I had a nickel for every time I accidentally broke one of these things I have like maybe a dollar but uh, what ends up happening is if you try pulling an oil pump out before you remove the torque of her clutch solenoid this part of the torque uh, the torque of her clutch solenoid actually sticks in the oil pump and um, this parts bolted to the transmission case so if you're prying on that oil pump to get it out and you hear it snap well guess what happened you forgot to pull this out and when you're prying up on the oil pump it broke the snout off of the torque of her clutch solenoid so make sure you have that removed it's usually when I, every time I've done this I've always was helping a student or tearing back into the transmission trying to find something that was wrong and I was getting ahead of myself so just basically pay attention make sure the wiring you know all your electronics are out of the pump before you pull it out when you're going together with it I like to put all the valve body a lot of valve body bolts with the spacer plates and the uh, gaskets on either side and I get I don't tighten them up or anything like that I just get them started and then I go ahead and tighten this plate on that's back here and I tighten my one two uh, accumulator assembly and that will lock the plate and the gaskets in place then I can go ahead and take the bolts out because there are tiny little holes little orifices and so forth that are uh, really small and every once in a while there's enough slop in these gaskets that if you're not paying attention and these gaskets weren't perfectly centered the gaskets are going to cover a hole and then you'll have problems so you want to make sure these gaskets are as centered as possible and like you'll see on the next slide this this bolt right there and this bolt actually have uh, a real tight small cut gasket and the spacer plates holes are smaller so those two are like the kind of the guides but I not only do I get those started but I also start the rest because there's still a little bit of movement that it can occur holding it uh, tight up front even if you got a little bit of slop could be make for a lot of movement towards the back so it only takes a couple extra maybe 20 seconds more by threading these things in 
and uh, bolting these back, the, the accumulator cover and the little plate, by bolting those things down, then I'm uh, I'm good to go. And I, don't, I, I can take these bolts out and drop the valve body on. This just identifies those two that have the tighter tolerance with the gaskets and the plate. So that way, if you're, if you're going to be lazy and you're just going to put two in to hold it in place, definitely make it be those two because those are the ones that are machined uh, pretty much about the same size as the bolt. Transmissions are notorious also for wearing out some valve body bores. The earlier ones were really notorious for wearing out what they call a torque ver clutch PWM uh, valve. And this actually shows it. It's not the easiest to see, but right there, you can see where the valve body kind of is notched. And I'll raise that. You can see it on the bottom on the top. I'll raise it so that way you can see it now. But, oops, it's like the eraser. Uh, so if you look, what happened is that this valve right here wore into the valve body. Now, when oil is traveling through those passages, instead of going where it's supposed to go, it can actually leak out. And that caused a lot of transmissions to fail. And uh, it caused basically the P1870 uh, P1870 code, which was a transmission component slipping code. And on the newer model years, I believe it was a 742, a torque converter clutch slippage or something like that. But so, you know, when you run into those issues, you want to make sure that these valve body bores aren't worn out. And when we go through this transmission too, you're going to have to look at the Sonics chart, a uh, vacuum chart. And we're going to go through and vacuum test some of these bores to make sure that they're good. And what a vacuum test does is it, it, you, you take the valve out, you clean it, you put it back in so it's dry. And then you try to draw a vacuum in that area and it should pull a decent amount of vacuum. If it doesn't, that means the clearance between the, the valve body bore and the valve itself is excessive and is leaking around the valve and you're gonna end up having a lower vacuum reading. And once you get a low, uh, once you figure out what's good and what's bad, you can determine how you're gonna try to repair that. What Sonics has you do is they have you remount the bore and put a new, basically a new aluminum bushing in there and the valve will now ride in that nice high quality aluminum and this is going to fit tight to the transmission valve body casting. So you've basically sleeved and repaired that valve body casting. Other manufacturers like Transgo, Superior, these kit companies, they'll go through and they have their ways of fixing this that usually don't involve machining or reaming valve body bores. But some people have their preferences over uh, of, of doing it one way versus the other. The valve body has a few different size bolts. Some of them are obvious, like these bolts over here are like a half inch shorter than the rest. But the vast majority of these bolts are the same length. So like all these bolts right here are the same length, but these are different. They're eight millimeter heads and they're about a quarter of an inch longer. So for some reason, students like to put one of those bolts right there. They, I don't know which one, they probably put that one there for some reason, but if you put an eight millimeter headed bolt in this spot or in this spot, it's gonna go through and contact part of the gear set and it's gonna lock it up. And if it doesn't lock it up, it's gonna contact it and bend it over or destroy the tip of it. So that way when you pull this bolt out, it's gonna take out the threads and do some damage on the way out. So try to remember that not all these bolts are the same and that I need to put the eight millimeter headed bolts in these look this location right here. 